Okay. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it really is an honor to be here. I'd like to particularly thank um, the KMI and WMU and the Korean government for supporting this and for hosting me and for inviting me back again to Busan. I think this is my fifth time in Busan. It is honestly one of my favorite cities. If you get a chance to go out and explore and wander, please do. Uh, there are amazing places and coastlines and ridges to climb. It's a beautiful city. I really enjoy it here. Um, anyway, so I'm looking forward to giving this talk. And as soon as I work out the technology, excellent. OK, I'm going to talk about IUU fishing, but I'm going to talk about it actually from an equity um, lens. Um, I know I'm supposed to talk about sustainability, but sustainability and equity are inherently linked. So I'm going to focus more on the equity side. I'm also noticing that you're all technical experts and you know way more about this than I do. So I'm not going to try to lecture to you about something that you know more about than I do. So rather than talk about details of IUU fishing, I'm going to focus on some of the broader questions. Uh, basically, that we need to consider when we are actually talking about IOU fishing, when we're trying to manage or respond or prevent IOU fishing, I want to go broader than the technical. So I'm going to give a bit of background to ocean governance and sustainable development and sovereign rights of coastal states. I'm going to talk about the problems with the term IOU fishing, conflating IOU fishing. And then I'm going to talk about some of the equity questions that surround this and require consideration. Um, a little bit about me. I come from the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security. Um, we're the only multidisciplinary centre of its type in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we've been on a massive growth curve for the last 10 years. I'm losing track of how many staff we have. I think we're up to about 37 now. Um, we deliver specialised research, advisory services, education and training in ocean law and policy, maritime security and marine resource management. Collaboration is critical to our work. Um, we're very grateful for having an MOU with KMI, for example. Uh, we also have an MOU with the Japanese Fisheries Research and Education Agency and an MOU with the Solomon Islands National University. So we very much work in collaboration. One of our key partners is the Nippon Foundation Ocean Nexus Program, which will actually inform a lot of this uh, research. And that's a collaboration between the University of Washington, various diverse research partners, and the Nippon Foundation. Um, the mission of Ocean Nexus is to establish social equity at the centre of ocean governance. So, in, a, in short, we're a very collaborative research centre and we basically focus on, well, my program focuses on transparently distributing benefits and costs equitably, empowering and building capacity, and enabling conservation and management outcomes. So, to begin, I'd like to introduce a concept of ocean equity. And this is very much driven by the vision of our director, um, Dr. Yoshitaka Ota, that ocean equity is a concept to dismantle systemic inequity through the governance of oceans. And the triangle presents our intellectual foundation for ocean equity, focusing on three points. Effectively focusing on anti-racism and anti-ethnic marginalization, anti-misogyny and anti-intersectional discrimination, and anti-colonialism and indigenous marginalization. Equity is not an end goal. It's not, sorry, it's not, a, it's not the end. You don't just have this transparent, agreed definition of equity. It's a process. It requires constant consideration and thought and action right through the entire process. It's not static, and nor is it easily answered. There will be different perceptions and understandings of equity. So it requires constant questioning and constant consideration. In effect, it's similar to racism and sexism in that it's not enough to just simply be pro-equity. I'm not racist, but you actually have to be actively anti-inequity. You have to go seeking inequities in your work and in your studies and in your implementation to ensure that you actually achieve an equitable outcome. It's part of the process at every step of the way. It requires active thought. It effectively requires action. So we have to actively be anti-inequity, like we must actively speak out against racism or sexism. We must actively seek out inequity and address it through equitable ocean governance. 
Now this focus on equity in ocean governance has been increasing, still seldom defined. So in 2022, our own Ocean Nexus program um, published a framework to support contextually informed assessment of equity in ocean governance. And effectively, through the literature and through discussions, identified six questions. Where, in what places and context is equity being examined or addressed? Why is equity being considered or addressed in this work? Whom? equity or for or amongst whom? And this is often a critical question, and I'll talk about this later in the context of RFMOs. What is being distributed? When and which stages in governance or research process is equity being considered or forward? And how do or might the governance structures that we create mediate, create or undermine equity? The point of the slide is that we must consider equity at all steps along the way. In before you've even begun, when you're actually considering what you might do in terms of the participation of stakeholders and co-authors and governments and actors. So, effectively, when we're talking about fisheries management, marine conservation, ocean governance, it's about people. We're not managing the fish. They don't pay any attention to us. Our maritime boundaries that we draw across the ocean the fish don't pay any attention to. It's about the people. We're trying to manage ourselves. We're trying to manage us. This is why equity is so important. But in managing people, we live in a system of sovereign states, jealous of their powers. This is the international nation-state order that we must work within. And why I'm talking about equity and sustainability? Well, the sustainability of transboundary fisheries, and this is the field that I mostly work in, depends more than just science-based decision-making. It fundamentally depends on effective cooperation between sovereign states and their subsequent implementation of conservation and management decisions. Consensus is difficult to achieve. There's often a block. But at the end of the day, with nation-states, we depend on those nation-states to implement what we decide. It also depends on data. Without data and knowledge, it's very difficult to manage a fishery. Our management of fisheries occurs within a geopolitical, institutional, economic and trade context that has been formed by centuries of colonialism, capitalism and power disparities. Our cooperation must consider this history and context when developing conservation and management. Failure to acknowledge that context or address that context undermines the legitimacy of conservation and management. It ignores the ongoing inequities and power disparities. It marginalizes development aspirations. It deters participation and subsequent implementation. And it also contradicts all of the international development commitments that we've made over the last decades. So sustainability and equity are intrinsically linked and mandated by our international institutions. Now, to go back a little bit, when we're talking about ocean governance and equity, a lot of the time we're talking about the law of the sea, the constitution for the oceans. It describes the key principles for ocean conservation and management, the rights and duties of states, and implements a zone-based management approach. By zone-based, I mean it identifies the high seas, the exclusive economic zones, the archipelagic waters and the territorial seas. We utilize these zones to define our cooperation and management. The negotiation of the law of the sea is a highlight of international political history and cooperation. I think it's an amazing achievement. At its adoption, it was suggested that the property rights granted to coastal states would significantly resolve the open access problems undermining sustainable management. However, as many of us all know, by the early 1990s it became increasingly apparent that the law of the sea on its own was insufficient to address overfishing, overcapacity and destructive fishing practices. So, subsequently in 1992, the UN Conference on Environment and Development catalyzed a new UN conference that resulted in the negotiation of the Fish Docks Agreement, UNFASA. 
Unfasar was a large step forward in many areas and is often cited for modernization of fisheries management and monitoring control and surveillance, particularly its strengthening of the duty to cooperate implemented through the regional fisheries management organizations. I expect that many of you are probably also more expert than I on many of these provisions. But the amazing thing about UNFASAR was it also included important provisions that recognize the special rights and aspirations of developing states. From the preamble through Article 3 and then into Part 7 that provided for funding assistance and required states to consider the special requirements of developing states. In particular, the vulnerability of developing states that were dependent on the fisheries, the need to avoid inverse, ad, ad, the need to avoid adverse impacts and ensure access to fisheries by subsistence, small-scale artisanal fishers and women fish workers, as well as indigenous um, people, and the need to ensure that conservation and management measures do not result in transferring directly or indirectly a disproportionate burden of conservation onto developing states. Now I highlight that developing states because I hear that misrepresented all the time in RFMO meetings where since about 2007-2008, particularly in the WCPFC, we've had many, many discussions now about disproportionate burden. And I frequently hear developed states referring to this now, ensuring that no one must endure a disproportionate burden of conservation. But the international legal framework is very, very clear. We wrote this to focus on developing states, to recognize and protect the special requirements of developing states. It was written in the context of colonial history. We also see similar provisions in the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. The capacity of developing countries to implement should be taken into account. And in order to achieve the objectives, we see language as well regarding the special recognition of the, the special circumstances and requirements of developing countries. And support for the adoption of measures to address the needs of developing countries especially in the areas of financial and technical assistance, technical transfer, technology transfer, training, scientific cooperation, and enhancing their own ability to develop their own fisheries as well as participate in high seas fisheries, including access to such fisheries. Now, I'd have to note that we are here, thanks to the Korean government, WMU and KMI, in this light. So I'd very much like to be, um, to be grateful for all of you, and for KMI, WMU and the Korean government, for perpetuating this, it's really important. But of course, it also requires political action when we sit down and negotiate access and conservation and management measure and, and responses to IOU fishing. Finally, in this international framework, we also remember the UN Sustainable Development Goals and particularly SDG 14. And one of the key targets of SDG 14 was number seven, increasing benefits to small island developing states. And that requires action, and that requires change in order to enable that to happen. That's not just about training and capacity building, that's also about how we manage our oceans. And this is important, because when we talk about sustainable development, for many coastal states, particularly small island developing states, sustainable development depends on fisheries for food security, livelihoods, revenue and employment. Access fees from foreign fishing vessels pay for schools and hospitals, infrastructure and technology. Artisanal fishers maintain communities. Industrial fisheries, ports and processing all provide development opportunities. But they all depend on a productive and sustainable fishery and on their exclusive sovereign rights to determine management development and access. Sovereign rights. So what are these sovereign rights? When I talk about ocean governance and fisheries, I like to show this slide. It's a map of the world's largest ocean, which is also home to the world's largest tuna fishery. It covers almost half of the planet. If you look at it through a North Atlantic continental lens, from Europe and from North America, for example, you will see a whole bunch of nothing. It's a whole bunch of blue ocean, and the countries in it are so small we can barely see them. They appear as just dots. 
Kiribati, for example, a country I spent a lot of time working in. Kiribati is one of the smallest countries in the world, according to this map. 33 tiny atolls, less than 820 square kilometers of land. It's a country so small in this terrestrial lens that when you stand on the country, you can see ocean everywhere. That's all there is around you. And that's what the North American, North European terrestrial view is. It's a whole bunch of nothing. It's wide open. But the law of the sea changed that. What the law of the sea did is it recognized and granted these exclusive economic zones, archipelagic waters and territorial seas, and in so doing, it recognized sovereign rights and it recognized the people of this ocean. So in that way, Kiribati, that we looked at as being this tiny, tiny country, is actually the world's 12th largest country. It has an EZ of three and a half million square kilometers. It's a large country. And as the Pacific Island states refer to themselves as big ocean states, or BOSS. So the law of the sea recognized the sovereign rights over EZs, fundamentally changing the legal framework and the perception and narrative about oceans. So for example, 87% of the Pacific tuna, the world's largest tuna fishery, are caught in waters under national jurisdiction. Almost 60% of the catch is taken from the Pacific Island waters. And some of these countries are so big that in a good year, 10 to 20% of all global skipjack catches are taken inside that Kiribati EZ. It gives you an idea of the scale and the resources for some of these countries. So these sovereign rights are critical. This is what we're talking about. And they really are critical in the Pacific. They're also critical elsewhere in places like the Indian Ocean, for example. So in the Pacific Ocean, just briefly, we see the Pacific fisheries revenue that comes in from these sovereign rights over the tuna fisheries comprising very, very large shares of revenue. For example, in Marshall Islands, it's almost 50% of government revenue. And for Kiribati, it's 70%. There was one year in Kiribati when I worked there where it got over 90%. Imagine your budget for building hospitals and schools comes from one resource to that degree. And that's what it's like for some of these countries. They are fundamentally important to the very nature and integrity and survival of some of these countries. So sovereign rights. They create immediate and long-term value, both in financial and other terms, such as food security and livelihoods. The fishing licenses and access agreements are the mechanisms through which governments earn revenue and manage activity. The fees charged for a fishing license or an access agreement are calculated in part based on the likely catch in that specified period and the value of that catch. This calculation is based on historical and current data. That data point again. Accurate reporting and catch attribution are critical to the value, development and management of coastal state sovereign rights. Accurate attribution to a coastal state is critical given the importance of, of catch history as a factor in RFMO limit and quota setting, not just in terms of access agreements but also internationally for cooperation. So the licenses and access fees charged are based on the likely catch in the specified period of the agreement only. They don't provide any compensation. There's no fees paid for future rights or catch history. They don't sell the future. And the reason why this is important is because some of the statements that we've seen, particularly in the Indian Ocean region, where we see developed distant water fishing countries demand that the catch attribution from someone else's EZ be attributed to their vessels, despite the fact that all they paid for was access to that EZ for one year with no payment or calculation on any future catch history and no language in that agreement whatsoever about transfer of rights. So there's some important points here that have been quite contentious lately. And the analogy that we'd like to use, I'm going to steal this from an Australian delegate who said it, um, in an orchard, the farmer sells the fruit, not the trees. Access agreements for foreign vessels sell a license to fish for a limited period, not ongoing rights forever. It's all backed up in the law of the sea. It's 
common practice just about everywhere in the world, but we just have one problem with one particular developed distant water fishing state or consortium or group in the Indian Ocean region. So we wrote an article about it that was published um, and that goes through in detail about catch attribution and its significance to equity and transboundary fisheries. So we see this access agreements and licenses don't transfer rights to a fish, they just sell access to the fishing ground and we see that just about everywhere in the world that's commonly understood, we just have one problem, mostly in the Indian Ocean. So the value of a coastal state's EZ and the benefits it provides depends on the current and future integrity of its exclusive sovereign rights, the ongoing productivity of its natural resources and the efficacy and quality of the reporting, science and governance frameworks. They can be undermined by flag-based models of catch reporting and attribution that undermine coastal state opportunities through RFMO limits and quotas that are dominated by flag state catch history that goes back to a lot of the colonial history and context that we still work within. They can be undermined by destructive fishing practices, overfishing or overcapacity beyond a level that optimizes management objectives or reduces um, productivity. And they can be also undermined by illegal fishing, by unreported fishing, and by unregulated fishing. And this is where I'd like to talk about some of the problems with this terminology and the conflating of the terms. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishery, fishing are all critical challenges to developing coastal states. We know that. Um, all three undermine their sovereign rights but in different ways. Conflating them in one term, IUU fishing, can confuse objectives and responses. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing are not all illegal, despite often being conflated. The FAO IPOA on IAU fishing defines three individual terms but does not provide a definition for IAU. But the subsequent literature has further elaborated. And we see that in various papers that have come out over the last couple of decades. For reasons I still don't understand, I edit a large global journal. Um, it's a crazy amount of work and I hit myself frequently over the head for agreeing to do it. But it also means that I get to see a lot of papers that come in. And I get to see a lot of papers that constantly conflate IEU fishing and that tell me that 35% of the catch in the Pacific Ocean is illegal. It's like, what? So I see this problem all the time where I get papers that conflate illegal and I'm constantly going back to authors to explain to them that they need to be careful how they represent I and you and you and to take apart those terminologies when they actually discuss them. When they aggregate them, they need to be careful how they aggregate them. So I have a bit of a thing about it. This is a little bit of a rant. So we see a growing body of literature that's been emerging, highlighting the limitations of the term IUU. The term's been criticised for conflating what are three distinct fishery activities and for being subject to conflicting interpretations and misunderstandings. Conflating the multiple fishery sectors and the regions can also inadvertently misrepresent. For, exam for example, we all frequently depend on an important study by David Agnew and colleagues, 2009, that separately estimated illegal and unreported but the subsequent literature commonly incorrectly aggregates and cites the total as illegal or IOU. I'm not saying it's David's fault, I'm just saying that people later afterwards haven't necessarily fully understood the term and its consequences. The estimate for the Pacific included all areas in FAO Statistical Area 71, which includes much that lies outside the Pacific Island region. And it includes areas where relatively high levels of IOU fishing were identified, influencing the overall results. The Pacific Island Foreign Fisheries Agency critique noted that no FFA EZs were included in the countries selected to inform the time series data to underpin the regional estimates. When we make these estimates, we utilize assumptions and then we extrapolate. And that is dangerous if we're not very transparent about what we're doing and the limitations of what we're doing. 
particularly if it's then subsequently cited and discussed and aggregated and further elaborated. Conflating multiple fisheries sectors and regions in IUU studies and responses can also create negative equity impacts, particularly on small-scale fishers who are vulnerable to being disproportionately penalised as a result of ambiguous terminology. Small-scale fishers may engage in self-governance or fall outside state regulation. Though unreported or unregulated, this is not necessarily illegal. Small-scale fishers are often not reported due to a lack of mandate or the capacity to report. And certainly in some of the countries that I've worked, there really wasn't the capacity at either the industry level or the government level or the community level to effectively implement the level of reporting yet. So each I and U and U problem requires targeted attention and understanding of its circumstances, impacts and responses, rather than just focus on a global IAU bucket. Prioritization, strategies and responses need to look beyond the headline illegal IAU and consider the local circumstances within the global context. To talk about it, I wanted to give just a couple of examples of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. You know this more than I do. Illegal fishing, the definition in the IPOA, includes domestic or foreign vessels fishing in national waters without a license or in contravention of national laws. So for example, an authorised distant water fishing vessel fishing on the high seas EZ boundary turns off its VMS and AIS and then fishes illegally in an EEZ, reporting the catch as high seas. Hasn't really had an impact on the stock. It's not really a sustainability concern. It was fishing anyway. It's a transboundary stock. It hasn't actually really increased the effort that much. Its catch is still reported to the scientists. It's still reported to the RFMO. But it undermines the economic development of the coastal state in two ways. It violates the sovereign rights of the coastal state it does not pay for its catch, it's climbing over the fence into the orchard and stealing the apples, and it misreports its catch as high seas, attributing that catch falsely to the flag state. It's committing fraud, thereby undermining the future quota or limits for that catch state. So it's illegal, reported from a sustainability point of view, but it's misreported from an equity point of view. What about fishing gear? So in 2018, the Pacific community and the parties to the Nauru Agreement analysed data from their tracking program, their, distant water, their um, drifting fad tracking program. The study was limited because they could only get data from vessels that operated within their jurisdiction. So it was limited to the P&A jurisdiction and it included, excluded most data from the high seas. At the time of the study, vessels only forwarded about 30 to 40 percent of the buoy data or buoy data. Nevertheless, analysis identified hotspots for drifting fad deployment and numerous tracks of uh, drifting fads drifting through multiple EEZs. The average drift time was approximately three months with an average drifting distance of just over a thousand kilometers. For those who don't know what a drifting fad is, Effectively, a vessel deploys a drifting fad, which is basically a bunch of rubbish that floats in the water. It then is left to soak as it drifts along, and as it drifts along, it begins to aggregate fish. And then once it has aggregated sufficient numbers of fish, then the vessel can return and then haul um, the net around the fish, aggregating around that drifting fad. Technology continues to develop, um, so we now see that the drifting fad will have a sonar buoy to actually monitor the size of the fish aggregating around the fad, and it will also have an encrypted buoy, um, which will be able to report that through encrypted signals um, to a vessel. It's becoming incredibly high-tech, um, so that you now can use an algorithm on a computer to constantly monitor all of the fads that you've deployed, and you will be deploying hundreds or thousands of, of fads, so that you can then actually work out the most fuel efficient track to go through and collect all those um, fads as it tells you they're ready. So anyway, the PNA and the Pacific community uncovered high densities of drifting fads drifting through EZs. I wanted to focus on one of them. 
They also identified high sets drifting through Kiribati as Phoenix Island's protected area, otherwise known as PIPA. Kiribati has pro prohibited fishing in PIPA for a number of years and has previously arrested Persane vessels for fishing illegally inside PIPA, um, just inside that blue circle. Now, if you look at the map and all those orange lines are the tracks of the drift drifting fads, the white space is not PIPA. That's the US territory. Nobody's doing anything much there. It's also a prohibition on distant water fishing. The blue one is also a prohibition on distant water fishing, and it's a marine park. But what you'll see is large numbers of drifting fads that are set on one, well, they're deployed on one side of the boundary, left to then drift right through the closed area so that you can then haul them on the other side catching all the fish. So they didn't identify any sets in Pippa, but they did identify large numbers of drifting fads that were being set on the high seas EZ boundary that were then intentionally drifting through the, bound, the EZ and through the marine park, and they were then being um, set upon and fished outside the boundary on the high seas. So is a drifting fad fishing when it's drifting? How does that fit in terms of legal definitions? Because it sure looks like it's doing a lot of aggregating inside a closed area. If drifting fads are considered to be fishing, then a coastal state's sovereign rights apply to the drifting fads that drift through their EZ, and flag states under UNFASAR and RFMOs must ensure that their vessels do not engage in fishing illegally in those foreign EZs and must ensure, of course, in their authorizations to fish. So our analysis of the WCPSC, the UN Fish Docs Agreement, and the Law of the Sea concluded that a drifting fad in the WCPSC area is defined as fishing from deployment to recovery, thereby creating ob obligations to monitor, control, and report the drifting um, fads consistent with the obligations for coastal and flag states. It's fishing. So if it's now fishing, what does that mean for IUU? If this fad has been intentionally set and deployed to fish inside a foreign EZ without a license, inside a closed area, well, it's fishing. So while our analysis identified these general obligations, there's obviously still much uncertainty over implementation. And again, um, it's all written up in the Journal of Marine and Coastal Law. Illegal fishing also includes vessels flying the flags of states party to RFMOs that are fishing in con contravention of RFMOs or also relevant provisions of international law. So I wanted to go a little bit sideways here and talk about international law. For example, in 2017, the UN Security Council adopted sanctions restricting North Korea's fisheries and seafood trade in response to continued missile tra testing. Meanwhile, hundreds of North Korean ghost ships began to wash up on the west coast of Japan. I think it went over 500 in the end. We, we started studying this when they had over 500 vessels wash up. These vessels sometimes had corpses on board, sometimes were just deserted. Effectively, it appeared that they were small-scale North Korean artisanal boats that had fished beyond the endurance range of the vessel. The crew had died and the vessel had drifted, and sometimes the corpses were on board the boat, and sometimes the corpses were not. Same time, the South Korean Coast Guard observed hundreds of Chinese fishing vessels crossing into North Korea, but China refused to acknowledge any violation of the sanctions. So a group of us from Global Fishing Watch, KMI, FRA, and Anchors collaborated on a complex study utilizing four different um, satellite databases, and again, I'm not the expert on satellite databases. I can barely program Outlook. Don't ask me how to program code. Um, Charles is here, Charlie's here, so ask Charlie for anything about Global Fishing Watch databases, please. But anyway, the collaboration identified over 900 vessels of Chinese origin in 2017 and over 700 in 2018 fishing illegally in breach of the UN sanctions in North Korean waters. They were having a very sizable sustainability impact, catching over 164,000 metric tons, worth approximately $440 million. 
This was all estimates based on a very, very complex analysis of satellite data. From an equity point of view, it was displacing large numbers of small-scale North Korean fishers who were no longer able to fish in their traditional fishing grounds and were being displaced further and further and further afield. We identified about 3,000 of them fishing mostly illegally in Russian waters. Um, and obviously, if you've ever spent any time in the Sea of Japan in winter, you can see why they were washing up on the west coast of Japan. We then monitored the satellites after publication of our paper in Science Advances, and we've basically seen um, that that fishery has basically ceased. So the Chinese government obviously took action um, when it became fully aware of the extent of the problem. Unreported fishing. Unreported fishing is the one that tends to get me <laughs> the grumpiest. Um, so fishing is which not been reported or has been misreported to the relevant national authority or fishing in an RFMO area which has been not reported or misreported. In 2021, the Foreign Fisheries Agency and MRAG uh, renewed their study and identified misreporting as the biggest IUU risk for the Western and Central Pacific tuna fisheries. So the world's biggest tuna fishery, the biggest risk, risk is misreporting. It's not illegal or unregulated fishing. The study estimated 89% of the quantified IU volume was unreported, with only 5% as illegal. I have to admit a little bit of conflict of interest. I was involved in the very, very first one of these back in about 2008-2009, and FFA and MRAG have further developed the methodology, and I honestly think it's the best methodology in terms of the participation of the member governments and communities, and in terms of the complexity and sophistication of how they approach it. It's well worth a look. It's published and it's available either through either the MRAG or FFA websites. Why I tend to get worked up about it is having had some experience working in various developing countries, misreporting is often dismissed as a minor violation, despite the critical importance of accurate reporting to revenue, science and management. So the U, unreported, is a big issue. It's critically important for sovereign rights, catch attribution, revenue, schools, hospitals and roads. It's what pays for those things. And lastly, unregulated fishing. Fishing in an area by vessels without nationality or those flying the flag of a state, not party to the RFMO in a manner that is inconsistent or contravenes RFMO regulations, or fishing in areas or fish stocks where there's no applicable conservation and management measures. From a Pacific view, I suspect unregulated vessels fishing inside RFMOs is probably just about done thanks to the various work over the last couple of decades, particularly with market schemes. Certainly in the Pacific, there's not much point fishing in the WCPFC waters for tuna unless you're actually flagged to a member or cooperating non-member. So I suspect unregulated fishing in an RFMO is not such an issue anymore, just based on my limited Pacific experience. But, Unregulated fishing in areas where there are no applicable conservation and management measures is still a big issue and has increasingly become a big issue in the last few years as we've seen the squid fisheries particularly grow. So in that context, um, the same group that did the North Korean study, we've just had our paper accepted by Science Advances and in the next couple of weeks you'll see our next edition of that. Um, and that basically analyzes global fisheries um, for squid and goes into some of these unregulated fisheries that we're talking about. So you'll see that published in a few weeks' time. And that can be a key concern, again, for this equity point, to adjacent fisheries in EZs due to the impacts on shared fish stocks. And we see this in the controversy in the South Pacific, and we also see this in the North Pacific, um, where it's impacting transboundary stocks. Okay, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. So IUU fishing and equity. While attention focuses on headline illegal, unreported and unregulated fisheries are often a critically important and complex challenge to developing coastal states. IUU fishing clearly impacts negatively on developing coastal states through threat, theft, fraud, overfishing and destructive fishing and unregulated fishing on shared stocks. 
Data and cooperation are fundamental to fishery science, evidence-based management, and effective compliance. But conflated and extrapolated assessments, studies, and responses can impact negatively. Assumptions, responses, and strategies must remember the geopolitical, institutional, economic, and trade context formed by centuries of colonialism, capitalism, and power disparities. Assumptions often reflect more about the expert and can misrepresent the subject. So we must consider the context when studying IEU fishing and when developing responses, strategies, and frameworks. Transparency is critical, not just the subject, but the study itself. The study itself needs to be transparent about the assumptions made, about the authorships and participations and funding and goals and objectives. Stakeholder ownership and engagement are critical as well. So I've come up with a couple of questions, which I hope are helpful. What assumptions do your studies and policy proposals carry? Are they transparently and overly formulated and declared? Are they there, but you just don't acknowledge them because you don't think they're important, or you don't want to acknowledge them? Or are you even unaware of the actual assumptions that you're making? I, I saw a great example of this, and you can read about it in PNAS, where a group of economists published a paper theorizing a blue paradox had occurred around an MPA in the Pacific, except they had based all of their assumptions on a North American economist view of behavior. Well, of course, people would act like this when they're trying to get the last few fish before it all gets taken away from them. But it was a view based inside a domestic jurisdiction on North American economic uh, assumptions. The behavior made no sense. They also made assumptions that the seasonal weather patterns were completely static. There was no change in weather patterns. And they missed a couple of vital points because they didn't acknowledge their assumptions. So we wrote a rebuttal about it, pointing out that the fishery had dramatically changed during that time because of the La Nina El Nino seasonal variations, which dramatically impact on the fishing productivity in the waters that they were talking about. They didn't acknowledge that assumption. And we also pointed out that it was an international issue occurring under international law. So therefore, their domestic assumptions made on behavior didn't apply. And these assumptions are critical when you want to talk about making studies, particularly metadata studies that become very complex and very um, far away, very remote. So assumptions are always really important. And often, to be fair to me as well, you don't even know that you're utilizing these assumptions. We all live in our world, and we've all grown up in our world, and these assumptions are embedded in us as well. And following on from that, how do our cultural language gender, ethnic, and concepts of region or place apply. I love hearing people refer to the Far East or the Near East. Well, where is it far from? Because I'm right in it at the moment and it doesn't feel particularly far away. This feels like home. These concepts are really important because they impact on how we address and, and approach issues. How do institutions and governance frameworks impact on the agency of developing states? We work within a nation-state system and an international legal system that largely grew out of the Second World War. Most of the people who wrote the rules and the societies and cultures that we work within came from a very limited representation of those people who now have to work within that system. So those institutions and governance frameworks can both overtly and indirectly impact on the agency of developing states. How do commercial, geostrategic, and great power contests apply? And we see this a lot in IEU fishing. Through representations, through funding, through priorities, through focus. How do operational matters apply? And I tried to give an example of that with the drifting fads. If drifting fads are fishing, then why aren't we taking action on IEU fishing in regard to drifting fads when they're in someone's EZ without a license or a permit? How do narratives impact on fishers and their representation? If we always conflate IEU as illegal, 
then it tells a narrative of fishing on constantly being illegal. And it also then applies to all fishes. And we often misrepresent that intentionally or inadvertently. And how do funding, publication imperatives, publish or perish, which drives my journal, media and global incentives influence these narratives and priorities? And at that, I would like to finish. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that's been helpful. This one? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, very interesting insights, especially on considering equity in every part of what we do. Um, which sometimes, you know, we forget. So um, we do have about 20 minutes for questions. I'm sure there are questions from the audience, so I'll open it up to the floor. Anyone has a question for Quinton? Yes, stay here. <laughs> Thank you for running. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Um, thank you so much for this very insightful presentation. You've addressed so many issues in such a short time period, issues that are very often disregarded, especially your last note, with regards to funding, with regards to the culture of publish or perish. This is very important, and I think that there is a lot of nuancing to be done, and you did it very well, so thank you very much for that. Morning, Quentin. Quentin, morning, and thanks very much. Just something else to add, I guess, to the equity issue. The recent study we did, and I'll talk more about that on, on, on Wednesday, uh, looked at what we called IUU by necessity, which adds another perspective, I guess, to the whole issue. We, we tend to see IUU as something that is done on purpose, mm. financial gain, um, however you describe that. But there is this other side about millions of fishers around the world due to a whole bunch of, of, of outside influences, whether that's climate change or poverty or anything else, um, that end up essentially under this IUU by necessity, which is a a really interesting concept and certainly something that we had to work into 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 our work so just any thoughts on that is it is the it valid issue is it something you've come across um, thanks that, very much that was very much the North Korean paper so that was the thousands of North Korean artisanal fishing boats that were displaced by the Chinese effort inside the North Korean EZ so then they were fishing illegally in the Russian EZ they were fishing in the Sea of Japan um, and I don't think they wanted to die at sea. It's, it's, it's that fishing because you have to. Mm. I mean, we uh, a large part of our, our uh, work was looking at, at what is happening in Africa. And with climate change and the central lakes in Africa, for instance, drying up. And, and country boundaries then being disputed and crossed over simply because these fishers had to keep on feeding uh, the communities and their families. That's fishing by necessity. And yes, you, you, you might be breaking theoretical laws and national laws and country laws, but you're not doing it for financial gain. You're doing it for survival. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it and learned a few things. But I have a question that is going to be a follow-up from Eric's question. And that relates to our understanding of IU fishing and how the laws are formulated. And based on the fact that a lot of the times, especially when we look at the artisanal sector, some of their responses in, search, in the process of searching for fish, I could say, then end up engaging in illegal fishing. Based on that knowledge, is it therefore fair for us to have a law that looks at IE fishing both by the industrial vessels or industrial sectors and the artisanal sector in the same way? 
So therefore, it means in terms of trying to formulate laws, we have a sweeping generalization of what IE fishing is and what the laws that we need to um, put in place to address them. Is it fair for us to categorize the activities of IE fishing when it's done by artisanal sector and when it's done by industrial sector in the same way? That's the question, thank you. Now that was the point I was trying to make about the conflation of sectors and regions. Um, an example would be um, in some of the countries I've worked at, legislation is often very old. There's also very limited capacity to renew that legislation. So, so it's often a lot of work. And there's also often a limited capacity um, to, to have you know, suitable um, lawyers who are actually trained in drafting legislation. So it's often a difficult um, task. And in some of the countries, it's also required funding to bring in ODA, to bring in technical support. Um, and it's really important when that happens that there's a lot of consultation, particularly if it brings in people like me um, with ODA funding to ensure that it's driven through the communities and it reflects those communities and reflects that context. You wouldn't want a legislation drafter to come in and think, well, uh, IEU fishing is all large-scale industrial vessels that uh, are catching lots and lots of fish illegally and doing it in this way. Um, because as you say, um, it's a very, very different context across all the range of sectors. So no, I would not want to see legislation apply the same penalties, the same treatment, the same approach, um, because regardless of which sector it was occurring and it was all the same. I mean, that would just be ridiculous. I mean, it's also a case that in many artisanal fishes, at least the ones that I've had a little bit to do with, um, you don't have any policing or enforcement power. It's simply not there. There is no government capacity to police or enforce that. And the limited policing that you do have has to live within that community. So often you don't apply that Western model of policing. Um, it really has to be driven through the community. The community has to actually devise it and develop it and then also enforce it. Uh, and that's not going to be a legislated response like you would apply to a European per se and a fishing illegally in an EZ, for example. It has to be something um, that recognises and works within the context and the capabilities. So, yes, it has to be um, different. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your very nice presentation, Doctor or Professor. I have, uh, through your presentation, uh, illegal fishing include foreign vessel and uh, and uh, domestic vessel. Uh, usually in uh, Africa, uh, are you fishing include foreign vessel and uh, developing country are victim of are you fishing? Through my ideas, what is what is your uh, advice or uh, comment about that? Uh, my name is Sheikh Fal. I am from Senegal. Okay, thank you very much. It's good to meet you. I'd love to talk with you afterwards, and um, maybe I can try to answer that question better um, over a cup of coffee. Um, one of the frustrations of IUU fishing is it's, an, a tri it's a problem that's often not solvable in a domestic context. Um, so whilst artisanal fisheries, fisheries, for example, um, can often be a matter for communities or can be a matter for government, can be a matter within that national context, when you're starting to talk about the distant water fishing vessels fishing off the coast of Senegal through access agreements on the high seas, poaching into the EZ, um, it's a cooperation issue with the flag states involved. It's a cooperation um, between the different coastal states as well in order to take collaborative action. So I guess, and again, my assumption, I get caught up on this assumption all the time. Most of my life has been spent working in the Pacific with the Forum Fisheries Agency and the various initiatives that the PNA and FFA have put in place. So I have this really inherent assumption that I make which is that that level of cooperation exists. And I know that that's not the case. I also work in the Indian Ocean and the North Pacific, for example. Um, and that level of cooperation we see in the Pacific is amazing, and it doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. But the benefit of that cooperation has been that cooperative approach 
through um, you know, cross-regional um, surveillance and enforcement operations, through data sharing, through minimum terms and conditions for foreign vessel access. Because what that's done is it's meant that that's where logbooks, observer requirements, VMS requirements, AIS requirements have all come from. Because all of those coastal states have said, if you want to fish in our waters, these are the minimum terms. And you can't trade us off against each other because we've all agreed to it together. So in West Africa, for example, having that cooperation between the coastal states is important, not just with the flag states. Thank you. We have a question over there. Good morning, everyone. I'm Autal Wotawa from Samoa, and thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm with you 100% in terms of uh, the importance of IUU fishing versus food security and livelihood and uh, commercialization. My question is for your consideration is that People, uh, there are millions of our population that needs food, food security, fish for food, and also their livelihood depends on fishing. And a question to consider is how can we draw the line between IUU fishing and uh, food security and livelihood? Where exactly can we draw the line between those very important issues, IUU fishing versus food security and livelihood? Thank you. Now look, it's a really important question. I thank you for it. So in the context of Samoa, for example, talking about livelihoods and food security, the management regulations that you would want to develop will most likely have as their goal livelihood and food security priorities rather than necessarily cash or um, revenue. Um, obviously, that's a matter for Samoa and its communities to determine. But as Samoa and its communities determined what its goals were for its fisheries policy and for its fisheries management, then a participatory approach with the artisanal fisheries to develop that, informed by science, informed by the communities, informed by the culture and society and needs. Um, and then if there was a problem that overfishing was occurring for some stocks because population increases or climate change or other factors had reduced the productivity, and this is obviously going to be a big issue in many Pacific lagoons, um, then management would be required. But that management that would be required would need to be developed and implemented with those communities, given the nature of the artisanal fisheries. Because I expect that simply policing uh, fit, you know, national legislation would not necessarily be the best response in that situation. It would require the communities to own it. Um, so in that context, it's really the illegal and unreported well, the illegal doesn't necessarily become such an issue if the community owns the, the agreement, owns the limits and the management arrangements because they've informed it. And then the reporting is critical in order to maintain that development of the fishery and the future management of the fishery to be able to respond to climate change and everything. And then again, it becomes reflecting the realities and characteristics of the artisanal fisheries and developing the reporting that you implement. But I'm happy to talk about that with you again after. And if anyone's been to Samoa, it's a beautiful country. It's well worth a visit. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, yes. Down the front here. Hi. Thank you very much, and congratulations. I think uh, the first words were really amazing. The disturbance <laughs> of your presentation, we are not going to be to survive for 10 years. We need to change everything. Blount, we need to change the name of our joint work group on IU fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for disturbing uh, our peaceful consideration of many years. Um, terrible video. I mean, we, we forget about these poor animals. I mean, the tuna trying to find <laughs> the net and to escape. There is a, a, an animal dimension which we oversee sometimes. My question is just about uh, what do you think will be the interaction between BBNG and UNCLOS? I mean, we say UNCLOS, sorry. Yeah. Um, with regard to uh, what you define, you, you, I, you, and you, uh, and uh, different practices. Thank you. You're asking easy questions. Uh, <laughs> so my perception is that 
BB&J will have to work closely with the RFMOs if it wants to develop further protections and address broader issues. Um, how that proceeds, I'm not sure um, that I understand that yet, and I suspect I'm not sure that the BB&J negotiations fully understand that yet either. Um, but I assume that probably the best example would be the Antarctic and Kamala, you know, for example, where the Antarctic Treaty System has the Madrid Protocol that focuses on environment concerns, um, and you've got Kamala also focusing on environment, science, and including fisheries within that as well. So there's been a lot of negotiations within Kamala about marine conservation. Uh, and I'm assuming that BB&J will need to work out some relationship with RFMOs that um, can ensure that whatever decisions BB&J might make for high seas marine conservation goals or MGRs or other aspects um, are endorsed at least or um, compliant or consistent or coherent with the RFMOs. So I'm not going to be answer, I'm not going to be able to answer that question clearly. Um, the awful torturous video of the fish trying to get out of the Persane net, that was us swimming around Persane as about 2004. And um, I remember having massive respect for the crew working on the person. It's because when things got tangled, they would jump into the middle of the set um, and put hooks in and everything. And it was crazy. There were sharks, fish, the whole lot. And we were swimming on the outside. We weren't going to get inside it. Anyway, different story. Yeah, Francis. Thank you very much, Quentin. A very eloquent and interesting presentation. Um, and I think the equity side of things is, is extremely important in this whole debate. And I'm really pleased you've kind of opened that, uh, that up. Um, but for, for me, to put a question to you would be, how do you decide what is an equitable access agreement? You know, you've talked a lot about how much it means to those small island developing states to have these agreements. But how equitable is that relative to, for example, the profit margin that the distant water fishing companies may be making on that? Not my place to decide. I'd say it's the parties to decide, particularly the coastal state to decide. Um, the access agreements that I've had a little bit to do with in the past um, have not necessarily been a problem. It's the misrepresentation of them later as somehow transferring future rights and catch history that's been the problem. Um, there's no language in the access agreement. There's no calculation. There was never any discussion about doing that. And then they're misrepresented later on as somehow doing that. So that's inequitable. It's also misrepresentative. Um, but in terms of assessing whether an access agreement is equitable or not, um, the outcome, the agreement, the fees charged, the access, how it might interact with artisanal fisheries, um, what support it gives to employment on the vessels themselves, um, chartering and domestication of fleets, you know, they're all aspects that should be considered in the access agreement depending on the circumstance. Um, what is often inequitable is the power relationship in the negotiation of that access agreement. Um, so, for example, that could be complicating and conflating the access agreement with ODA programs, you know, with implicit or explicit suggestions that ODA programs might exist or cease to exist if the access agreement ceased to exist. Um, so the power relationship is critical in that. Um, and again, I think that's where the PNA and the FFA deserve such credit for strengthening their ability to negotiate those access agreements collectively. So collective bargaining has been crucial um, to that. Um, but I wouldn't say that access agreements themselves are inherently inequitable. I'm just frustrated with some of the misrepresentations that have been occurring lately. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I believe there was one down the front. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for the interesting presentation. Um, so I think one of the reasons, because as you rightly pointed out, uh, in the IPO IUU, is idea is not to give a definition to IUU, yeah. but it's actually to describe different scenarios that IU occurs. And then the idea of this IPO IUU is actually to provide a robust toolbox for a country to deploy in its capacity as flag, coastal, or 
or port state or even international uh, recognized market uh, measures. So I guess this is to be because as you as as you rightly point out, there is a lot of controversy regarding whether because as you may say, some of the on on the uh, the first EU the unre, um, unreported in some circumstances could be considered as illegal. So there is uh, some overlapping and also um, controversy arising out of the concept. But it's actually IPO IU does not provide definition, but its idea its primary idea is to provide a state as a uh, comprehensive toolbox a state could deploy to 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 address the issue of IU fishing um, and with regard to uh, whether fast could be considered as fishing I think uh, there is actually uh, article one in FAO agreement on post measures actually provide the financial fishing so fishing does not necessarily only be confined to fi the catching fish but could be um, the, the definition provided in the PSMA is fishing means searching for attracting and locating catch catching or taking or harvesting fish or any activity, which could be reasonably expected to result in the attracting, locating, catching, taking, or harvesting fish. So I think this could also provide a, a footnote to your question with regard to whether fast could consider as fishing. Um, because I want to take uh, this opportunity because I think uh, I know you have a lot of experience in the Pacific. So this question is not, re is not really in the context, uh, context of IU fishing, but what's your opinion of the Vanuatu's efforts in seeking the, the, the states like a coalition to request the advisory opinion of ICG regarding climate change. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, firstly, thanks heaps for the PSMA um, reference. I think that actually came in after we finished and published the article. So that's really good to know. Um, I, I, I wasn't actually aware of that. Um, and then in regard to Vanuatu's ICJ case, um, I have heard about it. That's about as much as I really know about it. Um, I would love to learn more about it from other people in the room because I'm not an expert on the Vanuatu ICG case. Um, I wish it well, but I don't know much about it. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, let's take one more question. I did see a hand. Good morning, everyone. Hello? Yes. Nice. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Medina Cham. I'm working in the Senegalese Maritime Administration. Um, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. I like this idea of uh, ocean equity, uh, which is um, really important for, for us living uh, in developing countries. Um, I just uh, have a comment uh, about this idea. And uh, I think we need to have it. It is a kind of principle and value that we must have in our different um, African strategies and also action plan in, uh, in our countries because we need to have this uh, question of equity and fairness in the fisheries governance and also in the future for um, the, uh, the implementation of the action plan to combat IU fishing and also in, a, in, a, in an economically um, understanding uh, to, 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 to have uh, more equity in licensing fees and, uh, and, uh, and access uh, to, the, to the sea and contract with, um, with industrial and, uh, and also uh, partners, international partners when when coming in our countries and making contracts uh, with us. Um, but an, uh, an, an amazing consideration is uh, the term IU fishing, which is not accepted uh, globally and uh, viewed differently. But for me, the different components, IU and you, are just illegal. And if we consider it like an illegal activity, we should uh, just taking them uh, in the same in the same way and and also um, consider the uh, the sanction the and infringement um, very strongly and not having a minus uh, offense 
or um, taking it uh, just like one superior, another inferior, in terms of investigation, prosecution, and uh, and the follow-up in the in the in the in the in the justice um, prosecution or or, or or just investigation because it's really important for the countries. Uh, how to consider now if this term is uh, a little bit um, con conflict conflicted? I think by uh, some uh, some uh, researchers, uh, how to make a comparison with uh, fisheries crime, which which word is going further and uh, going uh, through a kind of uh, criminality uh, criminality process more important than a minor offence. Thank you very much. I think you raise an important point, which again goes to that that context and assumptions and localities. So in the context of Senegal, for example, and the, the challenges that you face, um, I can imagine that illegal is a, is a very, very large component and the motivations and some of the criminal activities and perhaps other connections like that. But if you looked at the Indian Ocean, for example, you have a growing squid fishery occurring in the high seas. Nothing illegal about it. It's all on the high seas. It's by a couple of flag states, and there's no regulation. There's no RFMOs. So it's not illegal, but it's unregulated. Um, now, there's a requirement under the Fish Docks Agreement and the Law of the Sea for the duty to cooperate, and there's a requirement that you know, we must develop you know, cooperation to manage those squid fisheries. But again, it's always slow and difficult and long to start negotiating that type of cooperation. But it's not illegal. And then in the context in the Pacific, where I spent most of my time working, again, you know, it's, it's administrative. It's like, oh my God, you know, violations of reporting. They didn't give us the logbook for 18 months and all the various administrative burdens that, that arise that are difficult to address. Um, and then, but that has consequences. That results in reporting issues. So it, it, sometimes the criminalization, for example, of misreporting or unreported, um, it's important. But it's also important to make sure that you've got the administrative processes in place to make it easy, to make it simple, to make sure that the right people are getting the right data at the right time to, to achieve your development goals. So I, I, it just comes down to those assumptions and those localities and context. I'll talk about it later. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I know there are more questions, and I also certainly have questions, but unfortunately um, we are out of time, so perhaps Quentin would be kind enough to answer those during sure. the breaks or um, during the course of the workshop. Great, okay, so um, just another round of applause. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you.